Hi everyone and welcome to another Sunday Zoom meeting for the A Course in Miracles with Keith Facebook group and we have um, interrupted our regularly scheduled broadcast. We're going to skip the miracle principles uh, again this week. We took a week off for Easter last week and this week we're going to um, devote this meeting to a masterclass on a meeting we had six months ago um, based on what Ken taught as the core teaching of A Course in Miracles, which was being in the cinema or above the battleground with Jesus. And so what I'm going to do with this meeting, the same as with that meeting, is that we're going to begin by having a look at that video together. It's just about 10 minutes and then we're going to dig deeply into it. <laughs> Your ego will hate it, but uh, <laughs> uh, we're all big boys and girls now. We're ready for it. Um, let me find a way to share this. Uh, can I just check with you, Eli, that you can see that? Yes, I can see it perfectly. Good, because my Zoom went and did something very bizarre here. <laughs> Let me um, see if I can. Yeah, let me just see if I can have a program stuck on my screen here. Okay, let me see if this works. Looks very different on my screen than it normally does. So let's see what happens. When you said you forgive yourself. The you you talked about this morning and last week. In the course, we feel he's talking to us and we feel special. We feel Jesus is talking to us. Is that kind of correct in a sense? Yes, yes. Okay, and so, but that you cannot see anybody sinless, or we, that you cannot forgive, is that true? That's correct. So, we have to train ourselves that when we feel that disease or anxious, to ask Jesus to come in and help us make a new decision or see it differently. Is, is that? Yeah, can I, can I just kind of tweak it a little bit? Please. All right, don't, don't ask him to come to help you change your mind. Ask yourself to come to where he is. Okay. The more you, you know, as I've said many other times, many of you have heard me say, that if you could have an image in your mind of sitting in a theater next to Jesus, and you're looking at a play, so Shakespeare's play, right? The play that he says is our life, and see yourself as the hero of that play, and watch yourself on the stage go through your day. You know, think about your past days and past years and look at what you're doing now and watch yourself. You know, try to cultivate the attitude of stepping back, which again is, is the real meaning of asking Jesus for help. Stepping back with him and watch yourself do your thing. Watch yourself get up in the morning, watch yourself get dressed, have, have breakfast, go to work, watch yourself at work, watch yourself interact with people. You know, if you're living with someone, watch yourself interact with the person whom you're living with. Just watch yourself as you're going through your day doing what normal people do, being happy, being sad, being angry, being excited, being peaceful, being forgiving, being loving, being unkind. Just watch yourself do it. And the reason that's so important is that the you that's watching Steve on the stage is not the, the you that's on the stage. So that will help you begin to dislodge your identification with the self that's the body. So the line I quoted earlier, that the miracle looks on devastation. So, so the miracle is you sitting in the theater with Jesus, looking on the devastation of your life. And the you that's sitting in the audience with Jesus, watching what's going on, is the decision maker. And when you sit with Jesus, you become an observer. The right-minded decision maker is an observer, because it observes the ego in action. So watch yourself in the theater with Jesus, looking, the miracle looks on devastation, the devastation that's your life, and reminds itself, right, which is what sitting with Jesus means, reminds itself that what you're seeing up there is false. 
That's what that line is. That's a wonderful line. Everybody should put that line on their, um, on their bathroom mirrors and their, their rear view mirrors and their, their refrigerators and their wallets and their credit cards because that's what will help put into a meaningful perspective what your life is all about. It's looking on devastation and reminding yourself that what you see is false. It may seem very real as the body, as bodies do, but it doesn't make it real. The fact that it seems real doesn't make it real. All you need as proof of that is your experience at night when you dream. All right? When you dream at night, and we all dream at night, while you're asleep dreaming, what you dream seems so real. It's so palpable. You could touch it. And it's only when you awaken and you remember this was just a dream, then, then it begins to fade and you realize it was nothing, nothing happened. But while you are asleep, it seems, it feels very real. So it is very helpful. That's what makes this course practical. You just take a statement like that, and there are hundreds and hundreds of them strewn throughout the course, and just use it as a, as a formula, as a framework that allows you to now provide a meaning for your everyday life. Again, don't stop doing what you're doing. Don't leave your family because, it, because it's not spiritual. Don't leave your job because it's not spiritual. You know, don't do all the silly things that people do. Well, especially, of course, the miracle students do. Right? Be normal. Do what everybody does. Pursue a relationship, pursue a career, pursue a family, take care of your body, you know, whatever that means for you. But at the same time you're doing all that, try to cultivate, and it takes, it takes discipline and practice, try to cultivate that experience of standing back with Jesus and watching yourself. After a while, you'll begin to really see the difference, and you'll be able to tell the difference between the dreamer of the dream and the dream figure. The dream figure is the person on stage, the body that does all the normal things. The dream, that's the dream figure. And the dreamer is the one sitting in the audience with Jesus or the Holy Spirit who now is the observer. And that's all you do. That is what upsets and reverses the ego strategy. Because what's going on on the stage is the body, all the world's a stage, and all the, all the men and women merely players. And what goes on in the audience, in the theater where you're sitting with Jesus, is the mind. Now, if you get frightened, then instead of turning to the right where Jesus is, you turn to the left where your ego is. And when you turn to your ego, the ego very quickly causes you to forget that you're sitting in the theater. And ego would have you believe you really are Steve on the stage. Which means your decision maker not only has ceased to be an observer, it has ceased to be a decision maker. Because now, listening to the ego, the voice to your left, you're now back on stage believing you're on stage. Until at some point you get upset by what's happening, you realize something's really wrong, and then you go back into the theater and now you turn to the right. It's a constant problem for me trying to separate the decision maker from Barbara. So when you say to be in another place, that seems to help. But I mean, I find most of the time I'm watching my behavior from this seat. And so then, who is it? It's, you know, well, it's, it's harder. If, it gets confused. It gets yes. muddy. Right. If you could watch Barbara, you know, forget about where, where you're sitting. If you could watch Barbara do her thing and not judge her, then, then you must be in the audience with Jesus or the Holy Spirit. Because the ego always judges. If you could watch Barbara, oh, gee, there she is doing this silly thing again. She'll only feel guilty. She'll only be depressed. She'll only be this. She'll only be that. Uh, and you could watch that and say, you know, but she's just frightened. She's just a frightened little girl who thinks salvation is this, that, the other thing. And you could do it just in that spirit, then there's no judgment. If there's no judgment, there cannot be an ego. And that automatically means that you're, you're beginning to develop that experience of stepping back and watching yourself. But if you get angry at yourself, if you get frightened, if you get anxious, if you get guilty, then, then you know it's your ego, which means you're not looking. But see, that seems to come in later at the moment. I can feel if I'm in my right mind looking at myself, but then later on, the judgment comes in. Okay, okay but, that, but that's helpful too. So, so now you have an experience of sitting without judgment looking at yourself, and then somehow, before you know it, you're making judgments. But then that has to be something in you that knows you're making a judgment. And something in you that knows you're making a judgment which contrasts with some former period when you were not making a judgment. 
Well, that's helpful. The ego never lets you do that. So, and, that, and you just keep practicing that. I mean, that's the only thing which will give your life meaning. I mean, nothing here means anything. You know, if you, if you look at it objectively, you, you know, you don't need Shakespeare to tell you that, or, or the Course even. Just look at nothing really works. You know, nothing works outside in the largest uh, sense. Uh, nothing works personally. In the end, everybody dies. So, you know, what's the point? So what this does is that it gives meaning. You know, that's why those early workbook lessons are so, so important, because that's, Jesus is trying to have you shift the purpose. He's not saying nothing in this room is meaningful. Is meaningful. He's saying it, the purpose you've given to these things is what makes them meaningless. There's a, there's a, there's a meaningful purpose that is hidden behind the ego's meaningless purpose. But you first have to be taught it's meaningless. You have to stop trying to fix things in the world and make things work in the world. You have to stop deluding yourself that there's hope of meaningful change in this world. The world was made so there won't be meaningful change. But the mind can change. And this is, of course, again, in make, helping us become mindful so we could change our mind. This does not mean that behaviorally you don't do things in the world. It means you do them for another purpose. A lot of the do-gooders in the world are doing the good for the wrong reason. Their reasons are specialness, reasons are reinforcing separation. It is possible to do good in the world that benefits people in the world as the world would judge it, but to do it from a different point of view, a point of view that does not try to change the outside, but wants to give an example of someone who's changed the inside, who's changed one's mind. Okay, um, that was the video by Ken, and we want to really dig deeply on this today. Let me get rid of what's playing music. No, yeah, sorry. Okay, let's dig into this. I'm going to do a lot of reading from the course quite quickly. Um, I'm, I know people love following along in their books. I'm going to say maybe that mightn't be the best idea, but I'll give you a reference anyway, just so you don't wreck Eli's head. <laughs> okay, um, this is lesson 132. There is no world. This is the central thought the course attempts to teach. Not everyone is ready to accept it, and each one must go as far as he can let himself be led along the road to truth. He will return and go still further or perhaps step back a while and then return again. But healing is the gift of those who are prepared to learn there is no world and can accept the lesson now. Their readiness will bring the lesson to them in some form which they can understand and recognize. Now, Jesus is not mincing his words there. <laughs> there is no world. Okay, I want to contrast that with what Jesus says in chapter 2. So this is um, section 4, paragraph 3. The body is merely part of your experience in the physical world. Its abilities can be and frequently are over-evaluated. However, it is impossible to deny its experience, sorry, its existence in this world. Those who do so are engaging in a particularly unworthy form of denial. The term unworthy here implies only that it is not necessary to protect the mind by denying the unmindful. So I want to um, sort of like bring these together so they don't seem contradictory. On the one hand, Jesus is saying, there is no world. All right. On the other hand, in chapter two, he's saying to you, you do not practice this course by standing in front of the world and saying, there is no world. It is a particularly unworthy form of denial for me to say, the world is an illusion, my brothers are an illusion, <laughs> my body is an illusion, and then I get upset when I'm diagnosed with cancer, or I get upset because my dog dies, 
or I get upset because my husband or my wife leaves me. That's an unworthy form of denial. For me to go practicing this course going, the world is an illusion, the world is an illusion, and then getting upset about it. So a particularly unworthy form of denial is to deny that I believe what I have absolutely made true for myself. That's what's unworthy and useless. <laughs> so that's how we, we make sense of what Jesus is saying in both those sections there. Okay, um, there is no world. That means you weren't born. You don't like roses because you helped your mother plant them when you were three. Um, you know, you're not married. <laughs> you didn't have children. Um, there is no world. But again, you're not asked to look at it all and going, None of it's real because you have huge reactions and emotions and thoughts and beliefs, which is linked to all of it. So Jesus isn't asking us to do that. So what's he asking us to do? This is from the manual. I can't remember exactly where. Awareness of dreaming is the real function of God's teachers. They watch the dream figures come and go shift and change, suffer and die, yet they are not deceived by what they see. They recognize that to behold a dream figure as sick and separate is no more real than to regard it as healthy and beautiful. Unity alone is not a thing of dreams. And it is this God's teachers acknowledge as behind the dream beyond all seeming, and yet surely theirs. We are not asked to deny the world. We are not asked to deny our, we're not asked to deny our experience of the world. We're not asked to deny our experience of the body. We're not asked to deny our experience of pain, but we're asked to deny that it's real, that it has anything to do with the sun that God created. So, let me dig out um, something I didn't think of digging out earlier, so bear with me. So, who understands what giving means must laugh at the idea of sacrifice. Nor can he fail to recognize the many forms which sacrifice may take. He laughs as well at pain and loss, at sickness and at grief, at poverty, starvation and death. He recognizes sacrifice remains the one idea that stands behind all of them. And in his gentle laughter are they healed. He laughs at starvation because there is no world. Okay, unity alone is not a thing of dreams. And it is this God's teachers acknowledge as behind the dream, beyond all seeming and surely theirs. That is saying fragmentation is an illusion. The idea that there's people out there starving and killing each other and, you know, killing themselves and suffering and dying, that's not real. You, that's the dream. Unity alone is not a thing of dreams. Oneness is not a thing of dreams. So let's talk about the ego's separation myth. God and God 
as creator has created the created father and son creator and created cause and effect and they exist in heaven as a oneness joined as one it is one mind that shares one will okay so in heaven there's no god in christ there is oneness which is the one mind and one will of father and son that's what heaven is and into eternity where all is one there crept a tiny mad idea of separateness okay and with that there appears to happen a separation it appeared like a consciousness split from the one mind of god and christ as a oneness joined as one it appeared like the created separated itself from its creator and now knew itself in relation to its creator for the very first time so this is the first split consciousness the idea of a consciousness other than the oneness joined as one now this didn't actually happen this is illusory um not one note in heaven song has been missed which means god and christ is still a oneness joined as one but now it appears like there is consciousness the first split now the second split is that consciousness itself now splits into the right mind and the wrong mind the ego and the holy spirit and the ego is the belief that this separateness is real this consciousness is real i have in fact separated myself from god and destroyed oneness to do it and there is the right mind that simply remembers the truth this is the holy spirit and it looks on the illusion um and it doesn't oppose it it simply shines the love and truth and oneness of heaven that says that can't be possible but love doesn't oppose it is the mind where truth is shining which contradicts everything else okay and then there's a decision to make which is true have i as this apparently separated son of god destroyed heaven or is that memory true is that light in my mind true and we know the story uh the decision maker has chose the ego and went we did it we brought down heaven i i brought down heaven there's no way i brought down heaven and now we split off that memory of truth in our mind the holy spirit and we become the ego we become the ego thought system we become the thought system we've chosen and once we do that this is the birth of sin guilt and fear we make it up i've sinned against god i am guilty god's coming to get me there's no way he's going to stand for this now this one apparently separated son um who is now identified with the ego believes completely in sin guilt and fear um finds this intolerable it was god or me you know either there's oneness or there's separation we, you can't have both either god is still a oneness joined as one or he's not either i'm separate or i'm not you know so obviously if i am this separate thing and i believe i'm the separate thing then that can only mean i have brought down heaven for this i've murdered god because god is oneness if i haven't murdered god then i couldn't be here i believe i'm here this separate thing and that means heaven was destroyed and the guilt over that is appalling I have destroyed the source, the font, the spring of love and goodness. So I could be a me.
And there is the appalling fear that God's not going to take this line down. There's no way he will allow this abomination of separateness to exist. He's coming. Okay, so drunk as we are on the ego thought system, we come up with this strategy to make our, this new existence more tolerable. And it is, I can't live with this fear and, and, and appalling guilt and self-hatred. There's, there's no way I can just sort of exist like this. It's absolutely untenable. And so the plan is, I'm going to split my mind again into a sinful victimizer self which is what I believe I am for having what I've done for God. I'm going to split that out of my mind and I'm going to remain as an innocent victim self. And once I've done that, I'll forget that I've done this um, and I will be this innocent victim self. I won't be the sinful victimizer self. And we do it. And then once we've done it, we now believe that what we've split off the sinful victimize herself, we think that's God coming to get us. And we're going to be his innocent victim. Now, none of this is real. <laughs> it's just madness compounding madness. It's just psychosis compounding psychosis. And now the plan is, well, I can't stay in my mind here because God, this sinful victimize herself, that's really me, <laughs> that I've split off and denied, um, there's, there's, you know, I can't stay in my mind. It's going to get me. So I need to leave my mind. So this one apparently separated son that has come all the way down the ladder of separateness and madness <laughs> arrives at this point and goes, I'm now going to leave the mind. And before it does, it shatters itself like a broken pane of glass or a mirror into gazillions of pieces. You know, it's like thieves having robbed the bank they'll, they'll split up afterwards so they have a better chance of evading the police at least some of them will get away this is the idea so this one apparently separated son shatters itself like a mirror um, into gazillions of pieces uh, projects a world and thinks it has projected itself out of its mind and into this imaginary movie world that it's created and the idea is here, because I'm no longer a mind, I've become mindless, um, then God can't get me. So the world is an attack on God. Um, it was the making of a world that he could enter not. And here we are, the pieces of the broken mirror. Now, what I want you to remember is at the very beginning, there was the Holy Spirit part of our minds, and then there was the ego part of our minds, and then we chose this ego part and we descended in this part of our mind. Nothing splintered or fragmented or split in the Holy Spirit part of our mind. The Holy Spirit part of our mind is not what fragmented. It did not shatter itself like a mirror into gazillions of sons of God. <laughs> Uh, and it did not go into the world. The Holy Spirit is still there, okay, as one. So when I talk about the Holy Spirit in my mind, that's the same Holy Spirit in yours, okay? The ego is legion, as Jesus says in the Course, but the Holy Spirit is one. So when you connect with the Holy Spirit in your mind, it's the same Holy Spirit that's in mine, Okay. Your, your, your wrong mind is a fragment, it's a piece of broken glass, uh, but your right mind is mine. Unity alone is not a thing of dreams. That's what the unity is. The Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit in me is the Holy Spirit in you. And what Christ's vision shows me is the unity behind the dream. Yes, my wrong mind is seeing a world and a body and there's an insane voice talking to itself in my mind and it thinks it's separate. Um, and behind all that is the one Holy Spirit. 
unity alone is not a thing of dreams. Okay. This is chapter 30, section eight, paragraph two. The miracle is means to demonstrate that all appearances can change because they are appearances and cannot have the changelessness reality entails. The miracle attests salvation from appearances by showing they can change. Your brother has a changelessness in him beyond appearance and deception, both. It is obscured by changing views of him that you perceive as his reality. The happy dream about him takes the form of the appearance of his physical health, his perfect freedom and all freedom from all forms of attack and safety from disaster of all kinds. The miracle is proof he is not bound by loss or suffering in any form because it can so easily be changed. This demonstrates that it was never real and could not stem from his reality. For that is changeless and has no effects that anything in heaven or on earth could ever alter. But appearances are shown to be unreal because they change. What doesn't change is the right mind. What doesn't change is the Holy Spirit, the part of your mind, which is the same in mind, that is looking at the apparent separation, knowing it's not true. Love doesn't oppose. It just shines love and truth and oneness and beholds what can't be possible. So why is Jesus saying that you will laugh at sickness, starvation, and death? Those are things that are changing. They're changing. They're not real. Only the changelessness in your brother is true. And it's the same changelessness that's in you. All the rest is illusion. Temptation. This is from chapter 31, 8, um, paragraph 1. Temptation has one lesson it would teach in all its forms, wherever it occurs. It would persuade the Holy Son of God he is a body, born in what must die, unable to escape its frailty and bound by what it orders him to feel. It sets the limits on what he can do. Its power is the only strength he has. His grip cannot exceed its tiny reach. Would you be this if Christ appeared to you in all his glory, asking you but this. Choose once again if you would take your place among the saviors of the world or would remain in hell and hold your brothers there with you. For he has come and he is asking this. Will you hold your brother in hell? Will you bind him to the changing? And therefore yourself. Christ's, this is from lesson 158, Christ's vision has one law. It does not look upon a body and mistake it for the son whom God created. It beholds a light beyond the body, an idea beyond what can be touched, a purity undimmed by errors, pitiful mistakes, and fearful thoughts of guilt from dreams of sin. It sees no separation, and it looks on everyone, 
on every circumstance, all happenings and all events without the slightest fading of the light it sees. Will we continue to see each other and ourself as a piece of broken glass? Will we make that true? The movie we made to hide from God in? This is from chapter 28, section four, paragraph nine. I thank you, Father, knowing you will come to close each little gap that lies between the broken pieces of your son. Your holiness, complete and perfect, lies in every one of them. And they are joined because what is in one is in them all. How holy is the smallest grain of sand when it is recognized as being part of the completed picture of God's son? The forms, the broken pieces seem to take mean nothing, for the whole is in each one. And every aspect of the Son of God is just the same as every other part. The broken pieces of glass, they all look different. <laughs> some are jagged, some are smooth, some are big, some are small. But when you remember it's all glass, every aspect of the Son of God is just the same as every other part. Everything that changes has differences, has differentiation, is illusion. Unity alone is not a thing of dreams. The healing process of A Course in Miracles, you don't heal your brother. That's making the error real. Healing is knowing your brother doesn't need to be healed. He's not a piece of broken glass. So, you know, healing to separate is where I go, oh, I'm healthy and you're sick. <laughs> We're different pieces of broken glass. And let me do something holy. And let me fix what isn't real. It's not the healing of A Course in Miracles. A Course in Miracles, as I remember when I am, not a piece of broken glass. My right mind kicks in, and that's your right mind. The sole responsibility of the miracle worker is to accept the atonement for himself, not to accept it for someone else. If I think you're sick, I'm the one that needs healing. I think you're a piece of broken glass. I accept the atonement for myself, which says the glass never shattered. And what I am, you are, because all minds are joined. And that, and that healing of me will echo itself in you. but I don't heal you. I heal myself of the belief that the glass is broken. The extension of the miracle through me, that's the Holy Spirit's job. If I think you're sick, I'm sick. Okay, um, right. One of the things that often um, that passage, um, let's have another look at it. Awareness of dreaming is the real function of God's teachers. They watch the dream figures come and go, shift and change, suffer and die, yet they are not deceived by what they see. Something, um, I'm sure it's probably true in all countries, but when we have a lot of heavy rain, all the worms come out of the grass and they come onto the path. You would call it a sidewalk in the US, I think. And we call it a path. Um, and they come onto the path. And like, there's really, there's so many of them. It's, it's, it, you can't really avoid it. Like you would be, even if you tiptoed along, you're not gonna, you're not gonna avoid stepping on some. 
um, which seems, you know, a little heartbreaking and sad. Um, but I always think of that passage. Because what I can do is, you know, that's, that, that's, that's what's happening in the movie. <laughs> There's a movie of a footpath. There's a movie of worms. There's a movie of a body walking along. Um, and it's not real because unity alone is not a thing of dreams. Um, and, and I have a choice in that in that situation where I can, I can make it real for myself. I can say, well, the splinters of glass are real. And, and that keeps me stuck in my ego. That keeps me thinking I'm a piece of broken glass. And plus, I communicate that to the other sons of God that are the worms. Or I can behold a light beyond the body, beyond what can be touched on pitiful dreams of death and sin and sickness. And that's Christ's vision. Now, my eyes will always tell me the lie. Your eyes don't sh stop showing you lies. <laughs> the, uh, the eyes were made to tell lies. But can you have Christ's vision in your mind? Because that's what it is to be in the cinema with Jesus. It's to be in the world knowing it's not real. Now, I behave normally, but I know it's not real. Now, when we made the world, trying to get out of the sun here, when we made the world, it was an attack on God. Um, but once we made it, it's just a movie. It's not good, it's not bad, it's not right, it's not wrong, it's just unreal, okay? It's just an illusion. <laughs> it's not right or wrong or good or bad, it's an illusion, it's not real. Unity alone is not a thing of dreams. But, <laughs> I put, if, if I'm listening to the ego, I put my meaning onto it. I say it's true. The broken glass is real. And look what's happening with all the pieces. And it's bad. It's evil. It's wrong. But if I go with the Holy Spirit, if I, if I accept that the world is meaningless, that it's just, it's just unreal. Um, the Holy Spirit's purpose starts shining in the entire thing. And that purpose is forgiveness. Because the world was made so I could see my guilt outside myself. So I could see the victimization of God outside of myself. Um, so I could see evildoers outside myself. So the movie, it's simply a movie of the sin, guilt, fear, and separateness that was in the mind of the one apparently separated son before he fragmented himself. And all the Holy Spirit part of your mind wants to do is look at it and go, this means nothing. It doesn't matter that that's in your mind. It's not true. I love the vision Helen had where she uh, has a vision of uh, Mary, Jesus's mother, and the statue of her holding Jesus after his death. And... Um, and Helen hears Mary speak to her and says, this means nothing. Unity alone is not a thing of dreams. So in the cinema with Jesus, I'm remembering 
unity alone is not a thing of dreams. I'm looking at the dream. And like Mary, I'm saying, but it, but it means nothing. Unity is what matters. I see the one Christ shining as the light behind all the bodies that come and go, suffer and change, sicken and die. That's what I see. That's the changelessness in my brother. So only the part of my brother that doesn't change is real. Because it's the same part in me that doesn't change isn't real. And that means my emotions change, but they're not real. The insane voice in my head is changing constantly. It's not real. My beliefs constantly changing. <laughs> not real. Unity alone is not a thing of dreams. Only the changelessness in my brother is real. And it's my job to see that in my brother when he can't do it for himself, when he thinks he's a piece of broken glass. And I can only do that if I'm in touch with it in myself. I cannot do that as a piece of broken glass. And so we have this technique to bring our right mind to bear with our wrong mind. And we call it being in the cinema with Jesus, watching the play with Jesus. We call it being above the battleground with Jesus. Now, so the reason I'm doing this today is because, like I say, six months ago, we introduced this idea. And, and it, it doesn't matter normally how much I go over this or express it or sit. Everyone still thinks that I, Keith, am sitting in the movie theater with Jesus. <laughs> And I'm having all these thoughts and all these feelings in the cinema with Jesus. And that's not true. That's, that's the movie character. That's the stuff that's changing. That's what's on the screen. So what I really, really, really want to dig into today is for you to understand what is it that's in the cinema with Jesus if it's not Keith? This is the one I would, and, and, and what I love is about once a month, someone messages me going, I think I finally get it. <laughs> I know you've said it every single day in the group for the last year. I think I find, and, and they do. It, you know, and people get it when they're ready to get it. But today is like a bit of a push. What's sitting in the cinema with Jesus is not Keith. That's the movie character. I might think I am a pain of a piece of the broken glass, right? It doesn't make it true because there's no broken glass. It never broke. There is no world. Okay. Um, this course is about getting in touch with the changelessness in you. As Jesus says in the course, there is a part in you that remembers perfect peace. That's the part of you that doesn't change. What part of you has never changed? Your body. Every cell in your body is replaced every seven to 10 years. Do you become something different every seven to 10 years? Do you become a different me in there? So, Marcia, you're the one that's on my screen there. <laughs> so, knock, 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 knock. Are you in there, Marcia? Are you in there? Are, are you aware?
is there a U in there? Oh, sorry, um, you'll need to uh, unmute yourself, Marsha. So can you unmute yourself? Yes, thank you. No, I'm not in, I'm not, I'm not Marcia's, in body. Yeah, yeah, no, that's, that's absolutely true. But let's just talk about you and your experience of I. Are you there? Oh, yeah. Are you your body? No. No, because every seven to 10 years, your body completely changes. And does the I change? No. 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 It's funny. I was just thinking of that today, how the body changes every... Yeah. I'm just thinking of that this morning. And, and we could... Ego thought. Mm -hmm. And we could, in a particular... <laughs> particularly, just moving out of the sun here, uh, we could... Um, we could um, put you under anesthetic and we could amputate your two arms and your two legs mm -hmm. and we could sew you back up again. And would the eye change? No. No. Mm -hmm. And we could take your heart out and put someone else's heart in and would the eye change? No. 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 And, and you, when you were three years old, stood in front of a mirror and you had a three-year-old girl's body, and you had a three-year-old girl's beliefs about Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny and about where babies came from. And you had things that you that excited you, like dolls and television programs. And you had all of that going on in your mind. Mm -hmm. And and was the I there? Yeah. Yes. Yes. And here's the thing. When you were 10 years old, and you believed completely different things and you had different interests, was the I still there? Was it sure. a different I? Was it a different no. I? No, 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 no. no it wasn't. Mm -hmm. And when you were 16 years old and instead of dolls, you wanted boys mm -hmm. and, you know, trying alcohol <laughs> and smoking. Yeah. <laughs> um, OK, so there was completely different beliefs, completely different thoughts, yeah. completely different emotions happening. But was the I different? Did the I change? No, 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 and no. as you stand in front of the mirror now, retired at the age that you are, are you still the same I that you were 40 years ago? Yes. It hasn't changed. And we no. know this. On some level, we know this. Mm hmm. You know, in some ways, you, you sort of get to a certain age and you look at the mirror and go, dear God, what is this? <laughs> that can't be me. Because <laughs> the eye doesn't change. Yeah. yeah. There is I something inside all of us that's changeless. I get it. There's something inside all of us that's changeless. Mm. Mm -hmm. So... We have three distractions from what we are, the changelessness in, our, in ourselves. We have the world, we have our thoughts, and we have our emotions. That's the three distractions from the changelessness inside of ourselves. That's what absorbs our consciousness and the activity of imagining myself to be the thoughts and the feelings and the, 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 the fragment of glass in the world veils from me my identity as the changeless. But the changeless is always there. It might be absorbed in thoughts and feelings and its true identity is veiled from itself, but, it, but it's never not there. Right. The eye is always present. And that eye is the same in all of us. That's the right-minded eye. That's right-minded consciousness. Remember, consciousness is what's split. And right-minded consciousness doesn't identify with separateness or form. So the I is the I before it becomes qualified with, I am a piece of broken glass. And that's the right mind. Mm. And that's why Ken says that, you know, right mindedness is looking at the wrong mind with no opinion or judgment of it. That's mm. what we're doing in the in the cinema with Jesus. 
-hmm. You want to get in touch with that part of yourself that can look at the world and your thoughts and your feelings without thinking about them. The change listens. So that's the thing I got when I started this process, when I had that awful anxiety disorder. That's the thing I did get. And this is the thing people tend to not get. Okay. Keith and Marsha are not sitting in the cinema with Jesus. Keith and Marsha are pieces of broken glass. Okay. The changelessness inside of you is what's always in the cinema with Jesus. It's what it means to be in the cinema with Jesus. That's what we're doing when we're in the cinema with Jesus. Mm. I think I'm a piece of broken glass. I think I am the voice and the emotions that are coming up from myself. Um, but let me just connect with the changelessness in me. Mm. Because that's the right mind. Remember, forgiveness, it looks, it waits, and it judges not. Forgiveness is still and quietly does nothing. The changelessness in you does nothing. It merely looks and waits and judges not. Okay, when we, um, as the one son, the one apparently separated son, when we made the world, it was as an attack on God, it was a place to hide, there was all these things. Once it's made, it's neutral. It doesn't mean anything, except that it's unreal. However, the ego has given it a purpose. And the purpose of our wrong mind um, is that it will, it will maintain separateness. It will show us proof that the separation from God is real and that we're all broken pieces of glass okay and that the separation is real but it's not my fault as this piece of broken glass it's that piece of broken glass's fault they're the guilty one not me so the purpose of the movie which means nothing because it's unreal illusions aren't good or bad or right or wrong but if if i go with the ego's purpose that's the purpose that the world has Sin, guilt, and fear are real. Illness and death are real. Separateness is real. Okay, now again, the world doesn't mean anything. Nothing I see means anything at all. I have given everything I see all the meaning it has for me. <laughs> it's just an illusion. It's not real, but I'm going to put meaning on it when I'm in my wrong mind so that my separateness is maintained. I will continue to be this pro broken piece of glass that's separate from all the other broken pieces of glass. Now, that same movie, the Holy Spirit has a different purpose for us. Okay, and that purpose is forgiveness. Everything in the movie is an outward image of an inward condition. Look around you, you'll see death and suffering. And you'll see illness and you'll see murder and you'll see suicide and you will see horror and, and gory uh, things. You'll have war. OK, all of that is an outward imaging of what was in the, the mind of the one separated son of God. And the Holy Spirit's purpose for it is. You're going to look at that, and that's going to bring up looking at this neutral movie that's not real, okay? That has, you know, it's nothing. Um, but as you look at it, it's going to bring your guilt up inside of you. Mm. Now, the guilt's not being caused by the movie. The movie's not real, it doesn't mean anything. There is no world, okay? So, whatever you're feeling, was already inside of you. And that's the Holy Spirit's purpose for the world. Forgiveness. This is what you must forgive because it's what's inside of you. You might be seeing it outside of yourself, but it's what's in you. This is a symbol 
of the evil and self-hate that you have going on inside of you. And when you can look at the movie of this evil and self-hate and have no reaction to it, um, the guilt in your mind's undone. But as long as you're making it real, <laughs> as long as you're having these feelings come up in you, well, that's that's your guilt. And so, really, when we're in the cinema with Jesus, it's about us um, connecting with the changelessness inside of ourselves. Who is the one that notices that I'm feeling jealous? Who is the one that notices my anxiety? Who is the one that notices my feeling depressed or hopeless? Who is the noticer of that? The important thing is you're not your body or your thoughts or your feelings. That's the important thing. There's a you in there that's not that. There's a right mind that looks and waits and judges not. There's a you that can notice guilt coming up in you and getting projected onto your brother. So our forgiveness process is understanding you're looking at a movie with Jesus and it's not real. Now, that's the world, <laughs> okay? That's the world. Look around you. That's the movie. All right. Um, and you're going to have um, reactions come up inside of you to it. Well, that's the purpose of the world by the Holy Spirit. Okay. The ego says, look at those feelings coming up in you. Get rid of them. Project them out onto the other panes of glass, the other, the other movie characters. That's what the ego says. And the minute you don't do that, you're with the Holy Spirit. You're going, this was inside me. It's got nothing to do with the movie that's not real. Did you want to say something, Marcia, because you're muted? I'm sorry. I just wanted to say, because I was just reading about the Holy Spirit repurposing yes and so that's what that's about that's what that's about because the holy spirit script the holy spirit is not scripting murder and mayhem and murder and death and plagues and starvation we wrote that um the holy spirit takes what we wrote and uses it um by means of forgiveness to undo the guilt in our mind. We wrote it so we could see the guilt outside of our mind. And then the Holy Spirit repurposes what the ego wrote. The Holy Spirit doesn't write anything. The Holy Spirit is just this light and truth and oneness in our minds that looks and waits and judges not. So the repurposing of the script, which is ours by the Holy Spirit, it is now useful. Now the whole, now the world is holy. Mm. You know, and, and that's, the, that, that's the thing that can take a while to grasp in the course, because on the one hand, you know, Jesus takes us through lessons, which says the world has nothing that I want. You know, and the world is a desert where starved and thirsty creatures come to die. And then he starts talking about how holy is the smallest grain of sand when it's seen as part of the picture of God's completed son. What's the difference? Purpose. What's its purpose? Purpose makes it holy or unholy. So, excuse me, but so one feels... Go ahead. I'm going to close my curtains because I'll need sunscreen if I don't okay. see you. You go ahead, Marsha. Sure. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I'll just keep blabbing. Um, so, you know, we feel pain, okay? And you think you're just going to die from it. It's so bad. But the Holy Spirit is using that. It's repurposed 
to show us that that's just guilt coming up that doesn't exist. That's why pain is not real. I'm just using that as an example. Uh, pain is not real because guilt is not real, but the Holy Spirit is repurposing that pain that we feel to show us that that is just guilt coming up. Yeah. And I mean, um, so the we wrote pain. We wrote yes. sickness and pain so that we could maintain separateness, so we could stay a pane of glass, a piece of broken mm -hmm. glass. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, nothing convinces you you're, you're a body like pain. Okay, that's why we wrote it. Mm. But yeah. who is the one that notices the pain? So it's now repurposed. When yeah. we notice it with the Holy Spirit. And noticing with the Holy Spirit means you go back into the changelessness inside of you. Because yeah. if you have no pain and then suddenly the screeching pain, does the eye change? No. No. The right mind doesn't change. Right. Because the awareness of anxiety isn't anxious and the awareness of depression isn't depressed and the awareness of pain isn't in pain. Because the I is the subject and the thoughts and the feelings and the world and the body and the pain are objects. Mm. So there's the subject and there are the objects. There is the awareness and there is the objects of awareness. So we're not asked to pretend there's no pain. OK, the pain yeah. is it's just like we're not asked to pretend there's no worms on the road. Yeah. Um, but it's to be aware of a light beyond the body, an idea that can't mm. be touched. Mm. And that's what we want to connect with in our mind. The the awareness of pain is not in pain. Um, and so what we want to you know when we're in our wrong mind when we are identifying with the changing then we're going to be going well this pain is terrible and i remember when i didn't have pain and now i do have pain and the pain is awful mm -hmm. pain is bad and why does it have to be me and you know what did i do wrong and you know so that's the changing mm. that's the pain of glass having chats with itself mm. So if I'm a pane of glass, pain is a tragedy. <laughs> Am I the pane of glass? That's the question that the Course brings up for us. Do you want to keep identifying with what you're not? Mm. Do you want to keep identifying as a piece of broken glass mm. or not? Mm. Are you the changing in your mind or the changelessness? Mm. This makes it all so much deeper. I, I just oh, want to say does. thank you. <laughs> I avoided doing this the first time. Oh, no, no, I, it's great. Yeah. One of the things oh. that's um, difficult about the group is that, you know, we, we've had the group a year now. Um, and, and, and in the group, and even with these videos, you have new people joining us all the time. In an ideal world, I wouldn't let new people watch this video. Um, <laughs> but at the same time, we can't stay at the starting blocks forever because we're always going to have mm -hmm. new people coming on board. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so mm -hmm. are we willing to let go of what we thought we were? Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, okay, so on a person, on, on my personal journey, um, again, I had reached that point of, you know, there must be a better way. I'd reached that point of rock bottom. Um, and, and where I listened to Ken and I went, I'm doing this. I know this process is true. And I'm going to do it. And I did it in the beginning. And and again, I had raging anxiety in my head. But 
I did understand, and that's what I want you to get today. I did understand that's not real. That part of my mind isn't real. There is a part of my mind that's not the anxious thoughts, the worry, the hostility, the fear. <laughs> that's not me, right? That's that's a virus running on my computer. Okay. I understood that. Um, and so it was simply throughout my day going, but what does it have to do with the changelessness in my mind? What does it have to do with the me that's with Jesus? What does it have to do with the love and peace of the Holy Spirit in my mind? And that's all I did. It did not get rid of the anxiety. The anxiety was still there, just like the worms are still there getting squashed under my feet. Okay. <laughs> um, um, but I held that idea beyond what can be touched, that light beyond the body as what I am. Okay. And I did that. And I did that for two months. And then... And then something changed and that peace was in my mind and there was more gaps between the anxiety and it just, um, and I've just kept that process up every single day ever since. And, and it's extraordinary. I mean, when you get this, what's in the cinema with Jesus is the changeless part of you. Looking at the world and your thoughts and your feelings without thinking about it, without trying to change it, without saying it's right or wrong or good or bad. It's just a movie. Thoughts in your mind are a movie character's thoughts. They don't mean anything. Okay? The emotions coming up is your own guilt. It doesn't mean anything either, but you've got to let it out. And what you do is you watch the movie, which means nothing because it's not real, and you let your emotions come up in response to the movie and you're with Jesus. The changelessness in you is looking at the emotion coming up and allowing it to release. But, but you, you, you can't, you, to look at it with Jesus, you can't say, well, this guilt is coming up in me because of what someone did to me. There's someone doing it to you. That's a movie, <laughs> all right? You've got to drop your projections. This is the key to practicing the course. The movie is going to give you exactly what you need because it now has the Holy Spirit's purpose. He's repurposed it. The movie is going to give you exactly what you need not to be a happy piece of broken glass. It's going to give you exactly what you need. So all of the crap inside of you the self-hatred and the loathing and the fear and the guilt is going to rise up inside of you and you're going to project onto the movie and go, it's because of that movie. Okay, but looking at it with Jesus means you take it back. So the movie doesn't mean anything except that it's there to heal my mind. And you take back all that emotion coming up inside of you. You go, this is me. This is all me. The movie did not do this to me. This is the guilt in my mind. This is the blocks to the awareness of love's presence. This is why I'm doing the course. Now the holiness of the movie is revealed because it's bringing your guilt up inside of you. And yes, you'll project it onto the movie, but you take it back. You say, whatever I'm feeling right now, I don't blame the movie for it because the movie isn't real. It's inside me and it's coming up. Thank God. And all you do is you step back into the changeless part of you. You don't identify with the guilt. There's no guilt in your right mind. There's no body in your right mind. There's no pieces of broken glass in the right mind. Remember, it never shattered. It never bought the bullshit of separateness. So the part of you that was the same when you were three, when you were 10, when you were 16, when you were 70, that's the part that you step back into in your mind. The part of you that's always the same, that doesn't change when your beliefs change. The part that's aware when you're sad and aware when you're happy and aware when you're, that's what you step back into. And you, and you plant yourself there in that seat of self. And from that place, you allow guilt to rise and pass out of your experience. Does that make sense, Marcia? Good. 
All right, let's throw it open for some questions. <laughs> See what people want to say about that. Okay, Keith, we have a few in the chat from a while okay. back. So maybe sure. we could start with them. Just let yeah. me scroll up here. Um, okay, uh, this is from Philomena. A uh, question for Keith. Recently, I have been feeling such joy bordering around bliss, but the very next day I feel blah. And the next day again to complete out of this, next day again, a complete out of this world joy. My joy is not conditional or something happening outside and neither my dullness do any outward experience. I find myself in the observer place and also am, a, am observing this swing. I do not believe I am bipolar. So can you help me understand what might be happening? Yes, because welcome to the club. Welcome to my life. <laughs> because there are days I go to work on the bus and I can't control myself. There's tears rolling out of my eyes and this waves of love. And I look out into the world and I see such beauty and radiance, even in things that should be broken and dirty. And I, it just radiates. And I would have tears and I would be trying to compose myself on the bus so I don't look like a fool. Um, and there are days I have that. And the next day I'll get up and go. OK. <laughs> You know, I, I, I'm not going to feel that, right? Um, so what's going on? Does that mean that we're doing something wrong? No, no. Because when you feel that down energy and that, that's your guilt. It's coming up. So the fact that you have that bliss going on and you begin to see the Holy Spirit's purpose shining in the world shining and I, I i say that and it really is like it's shining um I, it's just like there's a radiance and a vibrancy in the world and and as you undo the guilt in your mind um you you'll encounter this um but that doesn't mean you're enlightened this is the point you know everyone has like one of these oneness experiences or these bliss experiences they get in touch with their right mind and suddenly they're enlightened suddenly they're out telling everyone i'm enlightened now it's fabulous and Ken always said, the minute someone self tells you that they're living in the real world, that's when you need to start running uh, because they're denying the guilt in themselves and it's going to get projected onto you. <laughs> OK, suddenly you're going to be the problem. You're going to be the wrong one. You're going to be the bad person. Um, and so um, my point is, I'm not living in the real world. <laughs> uh, just to let that everyone know that I am not walking around every single day in total place. And I have not completely healed my mind because just like Philomena, I will get up one day and I'll just feel depressed. But I will slip back into yeah. the changelessness inside of me. And I am the changelessness aware of my guilt coming up in the form of depression. And I might spend the whole day doing that. And the next day it will be gone. But you see, when you're not practicing the course, you'll get depressed. And then you'll listen to the insane voice in your head saying that's because of what your father did to you. And that's because your mother didn't love you like your sister. And that's because my husband was a bastard <laughs> and wrecked my life. Um, OK, so that's what we normally do. Right. But you're a core student now and you're big girls and big boys. And what you do is you let that feeling come up and you watch your insane mind going, that's because of what my husband did and that's what my mother did. And, and you go and you go, aha, I'm on to you. And instead, you sit with the emotion that's coming up. And you don't project it. If you project it, it stays inside of you. OK, if you look at it from the place of the changelessness, the you that's with Jesus, if you look at it from there as it rises and you and you're not fighting it and you're not trying to shout it down and you're not trying to choose against it and you're not doing that, you want it to come up and you want it to pass out of your experience without being projected and it's gone. That's the journey home. Yeah. So, yes, I used to feel depressed all the time. So, you know, 
I yeah. guess it's changed to joy now. Yeah, Some days I used to have anxiety all the time. I, I'm okay, <laughs> I'm okay with this thing because it's... You're it's on the right track, Philomena. The, the only mistake you could make is by um, believing the ego's um, first law of chaos, which is that, you know, there's good illusions and bad illusions, okay? Um, what's coming up is your guilt. It's not good or bad or right or wrong. Um, and you're not the guilt, right? You know, again, you are the awareness of the joy, and the love in your mind and then you are the awareness of the depression in your mind okay so there's a you and there's love you're you're not the love you're the awareness of the love and the peace and you are the awareness of the depression and the anxiety but but they're the objects of experience you're the subject you're the changelessness in your mind and so again so you know we will be the on our journey home <laughs> You know, some days that love is what we will be aware of. And other days, the depression is what we will be aware of. And that's great because it means that that depression, our guilt is coming up so we can clear it. So perfect. And thanks for the question, Philomena, because that's important. Now, OK, Thank I've you. said Thank you. that helps I, a lot. I, I've said you're not the love. <laughs> um, let me qualify that. Up until the real world, there is a you. That's a that's aware of the love in your mind. OK, now, when consciousness is undone. Um, that's where there's no more you and what you are is the love. That's the very end of the journey, because that loves God. OK, so but but right up until the real world, there's a you that's a, aware of the love and peace and joy in your mind. It's not so a little it's okay consciousness to feel this sometimes. and just observe it, right? It, it's okay listen, to feel whatever it is coming it. up is, is, is perfect. And, and But you step back into the changeless part of your mind and you be the allowing of it so that it can come up and clear out of your consciousness forever. That's what forgiveness is. Um, so it's perfect that you get up one day and you have depression. That's perfect. That's coming up. <laughs> <laughs> for you to clear it out because it's the guilt inside of you it's the depression about throwing away your innocence it's the depression about thinking we murdered god and and it's coming up and our mind will go well this is because my husband was a bastard whatever and that's where you stop it and you go aha let me just reverse that projection there that's why that has stayed in me until you know for 60 years that's why that's still inside of me because i projected it and blamed everyone else for it the movie that means nothing and it's not real and instead let me just feel the emotions without projecting them onto the movie. And I, the changelessness with Jesus, I'm allowing the experience of depression to happen. And I'm not fighting it or judging it. I am simply allowing it so it clears. Yeah, and I feel, I don't feel like projecting. And that's why it feels so worse because I just sit with it. It just feels, because the earlier method of coping just to project yeah. it, it's no longer available, I feel, to me, because I have yes. to sustain, observer more. But, but always step uh, back from that it. That makes... O always lean back from it, okay? In the sense of allow it to be there, but you want to step back and, you know, who is the noticer of depression in my mind today? Because the noticer isn't depressed. Just like, you know, who is the noticer of the love in my mind? <laughs> Okay, so the noticer never right, changes. Right, that's the right. changelessness inside of you. And that's what we want to get in touch with. Now, and I've, look at, I've, I've said this for a long time. You don't suddenly start practicing this and you, you connect with your identity as the noticer that never changes, right? That's a very gradual thing. Um, and and because in, in the beginning, that feels very neutral and sort of like, you know, don't know if I'm doing that right. <laughs> All you need is the intention. All you need is the understanding that you're not the guilt that's coming up in you. You're not the insane voice talking to itself. You're not the piece of broken glass, right? All you need to be open to is that there's something else that you are, all right? Um, and all you have to do is just, you know, be aware of your emotions and your um, thoughts and the world without thinking about it. That's the trick. Thank you. And ultimately, That's when you can behold the movie 
um, the figures coming and going, shifting and changing, suffering and dying, and and you have no thoughts about it, none. Okay, that's enlightenment. Yeah, I think it's chapter two where Jesus covers that. That's the one where he says, "Who is the you?" I mean, he's he's talking about the Holy Spirit's interpretation. Um, is a temporary expedient. It's like a correction for the ego's interpretation. But but that ultimately the goal is that you don't need any interpretation. Um, and that would be enlightenment. Yeah, there would be there would be you you would simply be the present moment. Yeah. Yes. Where should we go Thank next, you. Eli? And uh, you've helped me. You've helped me to this point. Very and good. I'm just passing the torch. Can't everything. help me. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank um, you so much. Pleasure. Where should we go, Eli? Okay, Chaz, you have your hand up, but I'd like to do with one more question that's in yeah. the chat first, okay? Because it's been there for a while. Does the right mind, this is from Shannon, does the right mind in the cinema feel love for the characters in the play? Or is that more emotional projecting? The, the piece of shattered glass loves another piece of shattered glass. Um, the right mind love is really the disappearance of self and other that's right minded love there is no self and there is no other it's really um you know when jesus says um Christ's vision is one law. It does not look upon a body and mistake it for the son whom God has created. Now that goes for a physical body or a psychological body. That's not the son whom God created. That piece of shattered glass is not whom God created. So what I've got to do is identify with what I am that is not a piece of shattered glass, that, that light beyond what can be touched, um, that idea, um, Christ, um, this right mind, this changelessness in me. And then that... And as soon as I connect with it in me, it's also what it's it's what fills up the gaps between all the pieces of broken glass. So it's almost like you can you connect in with the love that everyone really is. So it, rather than one piece of broken glass. Um, loving another piece of broken glass it's like you connect with love itself which is what all the broken glass really is i hope that makes some sense makes sense to me <laughs> um okay eli where should we go next okay Chaz, you can unmute yourself hi keith hi everyone hi Chaz. um i'm just uh wondering i um like the role of words or the course lessons in the process that you're describing of being in the cinema with Jesus. Like I've done the workbook a few times and I think I'm quite attached to the structure and to the aid of words. But then I also feel like I'm just sometimes using the words as affirmations or I have done that a lot in the past. And I, I wanna give your um, uh, approach a try, but I'm wondering if how I combine it with the workbook and what the role of using the, the repeating the lesson throughout the day and and such is is uh, plays in in trying to be above the battleground and uh, observing. It's it's really important to see how they're not mutually exclusive, um, but rather the purpose of the workbook is the is the process we've been talking about today. Like most of the quotations I've given you today are actually from the workbook. <laughs> um, and, um, and so if we take the, the workbook lessons, well, you know, nothing I see means anything at all. So that means whatever feelings are coming up in me were already inside of me because it's not, the, the movie's not the source of it. Um, you know, again, everything I see 
you know, I've given it all the meaning it has for me. Again, that, that that's the process we're talking about. You're going to watch the movie. Um, stuff is going to come up inside of you. And it's got nothing to do with the movie. <laughs> it's your stuff. And your temptation is going to be to want to project it onto the movie. And, and our process with Jesus is just simply not doing that. Dropping the blame and going, it's inside me. And let me look at it with Jesus. Now, I mean, okay, the affirmations thing. Look, I mean... You know, there's lots of ways to skin a cat and there's lots of way to to begin undoing our investment in the ego and in guilt. Um, and and, you know, on on the lower rungs of the ladder, um, you know, um, um, you know, things like, um, you know, mantras and repeating words and all these things um, are very helpful. Like they they are helpful. Um you know, like we could, it, like in the beginning, we could say, you know, we could we could sort of like look at someone that's doing something that we're judging, and we could go, well, you know, you are Christ, whole and pure, and blah 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 blah, and um, that has a value. That will help. Um, it's not, it's not where the course goes ultimately in terms of, you know, um this idea of being in the cinema with Jesus, this idea of right-mindedness is not ultimately that, but it's a great place to start. Um, so we would never say that that doesn't have value because it has huge value. Uh, and it's a great way of getting going. But the real trick is, um, who is who is the me that's with Jesus? Because remember, you have all these pieces of broken glass, but th there's only one right mind in all of them. So. If I'm connected with my right mind, that is Jesus's right mind, <laughs> you know, so it's not like we have to go and like try and join, like your right mind is with Jesus now, all you have to do is become right minded, and you do that by looking at the world and your thoughts and feelings about it, um, without thinking about it, without having opinions, without judgment, does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Um, um... Like. In, in terms of all that, I mean, even if you want to shout a workbook lesson at me that you like or something like that, we can put it into context. Well, um, I guess you, you've been talking about anxiety and depression, and I also have a mental health condition, and mm -hmm. I think I've been using the course to kind of cope with it. But what I'm hearing, get, getting from your shares is that, um, you know, uh, I have to stop trying to fight it. And Oh, yes. Um, no, that's yeah. that's that's a golden rule, right? That's the golden rule because you're making the error real. Yes. Yeah. It's just it's it's like a, it's a thought disorder, right? So it's it's sometimes I think I get into a bit of a head trip with using the lessons. Um, OK, I just I, I'm thinking all day, every day, and I don't part of it's like my health condition, but then part of it's just the, the human condition. And then I'm trying to find a way of stepping back and observing but sometimes i think i just stay with the words and you use, use them to stay concentrated and i'm not really developing the witnessing presence yeah, or but I, I, yeah don't, with that. sure don't turn it into mount everest of challenges all you ever have to say to yourself is who is the one that's noticing me obsessing about the thoughts and you're in the witness chair you're with jesus on the cinema yeah, I like how you say, and do nothing else, right? That's all you do. Like, that's the part I need to get, right? As, yeah, forgiveness is still and quietly does nothing. It merely looks and waits and judges not. So who is the one that's noticing? Yeah. And yeah. I, I mean, what, what I'm going to say is in the beginning, the one who's noticing is quite wrapped up in what it's noticing. But as you practice this process, your right mind and your wrong mind will separate them ourselves out in your experience and, and it'll become it'll become much more. And as that happens, that's when you start experiencing the, the grayness or the neutrality of the, the witness position. It starts to shine. And again, my experience was that it started off as peace and then it just knocked my socks off when it would suddenly <laughs> become this overwhelming love. Um, and so nobody starts off with this witness position shining in their mind. Um, 
it will it will happen as you pers as you stick with the process but the two things that you must you must work on is that it doesn't matter what's happening in the movie what's coming up in you was in you first so that that's you that that's your your golden place you have to start with you know you it's 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 undoing projection um what's happening in the movie means nothing i don't care what it is i don't care if everyone is murdering your family um right now whatever feelings are coming and that's not true because you never had a family <laughs> now okay i'm not saying you have to live like that but even if someone's murdering your entire family right now in front of you whatever feelings are coming up with you were in you before you appear to be born um and so the golden rule is we allow what's coming up in ourselves we don't project it we don't say you did this to me and um and we witness it so we're not identified in with it we're the witness of this coming up inside of ourselves um and and if we do that all that fear and terror and guilt and hate will pass out of our mind i mean if we could do that in a situation you know i'm not saying you have to you should but just you know as an fyi if you did have an experience like that where you could like you know allow something awful like that happening and you could just sit with the emotions coming up without saying it's because of what's happening that would probably have you enlightened you know because <laughs> it's all happening at once um much more comfortable in life to do the little bits so let's work on it when we're when our bus is when we miss our bus and when we have a rude cash register attendant in the shop and when we have to wait and when someone cuts across us cuts us off on the roads these are the little bits where we undo all this horror inside of ourselves but you know catch yourself when you're going you did this to me and look at the way you made me feel no the feeling was waiting to come up and the, the movie is just stimulating it and the trick is that you sit with what's coming up with jesus you step back into that changelessness and again mm -hmm. as we practice that then that changelessness is is how we heal the world um and the way we heal the world is by not thinking it needs to be healed because once you step into that changelessness, that's what everyone is. Once you step back into that position of right mindedness, that's what all the panes of glass really are. You'll still see panes of glass, but Christ's vision has, you know, it's all the one right mind. Yeah. OK, thank you so much. That's all really helpful. Lots of good takeaways. Thank you. Where should we go next, Eli? OK, we've got another question in the chat. And then we'll go to Angela. Cool. Um, this is from Melissa. Is it advised to cultivate my sense of identity as, in quotes, one who looks on an experience level rather than mental practice? And does that happen automatically through my willingness to be there as a practice? Um, so the right mind merely looks you know, when the apparent separation from God, when co when a consciousness seemed to happen that wasn't the one mind of God and Christ as a oneness joined as one, um, the mind split into the part that says, wow, this is real, and the part that merely looked and, um, and didn't make it real. Merely looked at the illusion and knew it wasn't real. And so when we talk about our right mind, that's the part of you that looks and doesn't make it real. It watches the dream figures come and go, suffer and change, um, sick and die, and it's not deceived by what it sees. It sees the light beyond the body, the idea beyond it can be touched. The one right mind in everyone, the one Holy Spirit. Um, so that would be our right mind of identity. Now, it's not our true identity, because let's never lose sight of the fact that our true identity is a oneness joined as one, God in Christ. Uh, with one mind and one will. But that's our right minded identity, and that's the basis of our existence in the real world. Right up until consciousness itself is under. So I hope that makes sense. Um, so well, let's go to you, Angela. Take yourself off mute. Yes. Stage is yours. Hello, Pete and everyone. Hi, Angela. Um, um, so Keith, I, 
I think I brought this up at another session and I do believe I might have to listen to this again. But so if I understand correctly, this consciousness is the distinguishing the wrong mind and the right mind. Mm -hmm. I understand unconsciousness, but is consciousness distinguishing our right mind and our wrong mind, to put it simply, practically? Um, your sound is a little bad, bit bad, but let me take a stab at that. Um, remember, um, outside of consciousness, um, there is only God and Christ as a oneness joined as one. And Jesus is very specific in the, um, in the course that God knows not form and that he doesn't know about consciousness and that he doesn't know about separation, which means what you really are because you're a oneness joined as one with God, um, your mind contains nothing but God, which Jesus says absolutely literally in the course. Um, and so that part of you that's um, um, that's real is, um, is outside of consciousness. Now, we are having an experience <laughs> of being consciousness and it's split into wrong-minded consciousness, um, and right-minded consciousness. So uh, one of the biggest difficulties in the course community is that nobody gets that about consciousness. <laughs> Everyone thinks consciousness is this like bad guy and it's like, you know, the, the domain of the ego. It's also the domain of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> so there's wrong-minded consciousness and there's right-minded consciousness. And that the only point Jesus is making in the course when he talks about consciousness um, is that there is no consciousness. It's 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 part of the... um it's part of the mistake that it's part of the dream that something can be other than God. Okay. Um, so yes, there's, there's right-minded consciousness and there's wrong-minded consciousness. Um, spiritually speaking, um, right-minded consciousness would be being awake in your mind. And that means that you're aware of the noticer, yeah. you're aware of awareness, right? That's, that's right-minded consciousness. And, and therefore being unconscious would be thinking that you're the pain of the, the piece of broken glass. Oh, okay, because, and so, and, and that's what I think of is when we, like if I'm feeling resistance or irrit like just a little bit of irritability, I recognize that. Now, you know, if for me, um, you talked about mantras and all that, but you know, like if I want to sit out on, observe the birds, or I just have this appreciation of all the nature what, or what the gifts that we have, it changes my mind. So yeah. would yeah. that be a conscious, I guess, choice? Would that fall into that? Okay, you that know, ties into something I just... I, yes, I just saw someone flash a, um, um, a question there on the screen um, asking, isn't consciousness the decision maker? And yes, consciousness can be either wrong-minded or right-minded. Therefore, consciousness is the decision maker. Okay, um, thank you. So, uh, but just in terms of your question there, Angela, um, you've asked about the effect. Now, okay. Um, so the, the, the world is... Um, a movie that was over long ago and that was never true okay there is no world and there's no cause in the world so again if I am getting um, anxious and fearful about something that's happening in the movie the movie is not doing that there's no cause in the movie that means it was inside me already um, and I'm projecting it onto the movie so that's how we we undo that but in the same way if you are um, watching a movie about waterfalls and butterflies <laughs> and you have this peacefulness arise inside of you the movie didn't do that to you that's what was already inside of you so thank you the movie and that doesn't would make be, us yeah go ahead and also i sound like the holy instant when we talked about enlightenment because i thought you know when you have that moment of everything oneness and yes an uh, awareness of um, how would you the changelessness the just just is i want to say would that holy instant be sort of like a a, a, a glimpse of excitement uh, yes to... uh, yes yes and it took me a while to realize that as well that you know um 
I, I kind of in the past would have thought that the real world is something that you experience when you've undone all the guilt in your mind. Um, and and therefore only your right mind is there. And so therefore the only thing that's getting extended onto the movie, which means nothing, um, is the love in your right mind. So you watch the movie and it just all looks like love. So that's that that's what the real world will be. Um, um and, and what I've realized is that, you know, actually you get glimpses of the real world. And so, yeah. Um, and so in terms of your experiences, there is that a glimpse of the real world? Yes. Um, if everything in the world seems vibrant and alive and faultless and beautiful and um, almost like it's love itself, um, then again, there's the movie doesn't mean anything there's no cause in the world if you're if you're seeing that in the world it's because you're extending it from your right mind so is that a glimpse of the real world yes it is oh, thank you thank you so much Beautiful. um on that i know like there's a part in the in the course where jesus says in the real world there's no electric lights and there's no um there's no people walking alone and so people often go because because ken always taught that the real world was this world with no projections onto it OK, uh, instead, it's just the love and peace in your right mind from that changelessness that's getting extended there and you experience it there. Um, so some people often read that passage about there's no electric lights and there's no people walking alone and they think, I know it's different. The real world is different. Um, it's not. What Jesus is saying there is that we carve up the world into uh, these little yeah. broken pieces. And we say they're separate. Um, and the point is that in the real world, everything is just a movie nothing is a good part of the movie or a bad part of the movie nothing is um nothing is old and nothing is new and nothing is right and nothing is wrong nothing gets carved up you you're just watching the movie um and so the point he's making in that passage really is that um you know you're watching a movie of um even if you're watching even if you're seeing images of someone walking alone, um, again, Christ's vision is one law. It does not look upon a body and mistake it for the son whom God created. So you might be watching a movie of someone walking alone, um, but you wouldn't make the mistake of thinking that's real. Um, you would be connected to what you are that's not this pane of glass, this piece of broken glass, and therefore you wouldn't be given any reality to a piece of broken glass that appears to be walking on its own. Um, you would be connected to the Christ in you, uh, which is the Christ everywhere. But you wouldn't be carving up reality into this, that, and the other. So I really appreciate the broken glass uh, yeah. <laughs> analogy. Thank you very much. And someone put that they would make it to stained glass, or you know, stained glass is going to look beautiful. <laughs> you know, really, you know, at the church when you go to the church and you see the stained glass. Uh, yes. In there, oh, thank you so much. You're very nice. Awesome. Um, okay. so yes, we're yes. Well, there's some in the chat, and then we've got Sherry with her. Hand okay, well, up, let, so. let's let's do that, and then we'll draw a line under it because we're as usual running late. Uh, so what's the chat question you like? Okay, it's I tend to attack myself much more than attacking or projecting my guilt onto others. Is that a common trait or habit or project of projection? Yes. Um, who is the who is the one that notices you attacking yourself? How do you know you're attacking yourself? Yeah, I'm aware who's that I'm attacking that, myself. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Who's who's the one that notices? That's the changelessness inside of you. Yeah. That's the you yeah. that's with Jesus. Yeah. So, so that's what you want to fall back into. You want to fall back into your theater seat um who is the it, it always comes back to noticing the noticer that's the trick because the one that's attacking himself is just the piece of broken glass <laughs> okay and you're not the broken glass you know you might lose yourself in the idea that you are but all you do is you step back and go how do i know i'm attacking to myself who is the one that notices the attacking and straight away you're with jesus okay some sometimes when I do that, and I've only been doing it for a very short time, but I can be really present with the change changelessness or the 
True nature. Brilliant. Forever. Oh, yeah. Uh, Great. I, I love here because once you've had that once, your journey is rocking. You only have to have that experience of not being the piece of broken glass once. And the light is going to bring you home, Adrian. But sorry, go ahead with your question. Yeah, well, no, just thank you for saying that because I needed I needed to hear that bit of encouragement. Yeah. But like yesterday, I had it where it just dissolved. Like, yes. Whatever. Whatever shittiness was there just dissolved. And it was this is this is what we're working towards because Jesus says in the course, if you look at the error, it will disappear. That's what we're moving towards, right? Mm. And and it doesn't mean the world disappears. It does ultimately mean the world will disappear. That's not what he means in the shorter term. But he's saying, if you fall back into the changelessness of yourself with me, and you look at your emotions coming up, they will, they will, it will, they will disappear. Okay, so I'm doing it right. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So really, really, it's very important when we have experiences like that, that we write it down, that we stick some kind of notice up on the wall because your ego is going to jump in and try and talk you out of that experience and go, that was your imagination and that wasn't really real. And actually you're a piece of broken glass. Well, what I find like some, somebody else said a recent or one of the other speakers there, that what happens with me if I may, if what I find is if I, have a little bit of a breakthrough like that. Yes. But the next day I get crash annihilated. Yeah. That's the journey. That's the journey. Yeah. Uh, exactly Not for normal, me. Because like... the, the, there will be days where I will just be going, I didn't think it would get better, but oh my God, this is better. And the next day I would be like in the bleakness of just like nothingness. <laughs> uh, that's the journey. Um, and but but again, it's so important you don't see that as some kind of indication of failure. It's not. You you can't get home unless all the crap comes up inside of you. So you can't get home skipping through the fields with the Holy Spirit or Jesus. The only way you get home is by skipping through the shit um, <laughs> with the Holy Spirit or Jesus. And so it's got to come up. So, mm -hmm. and, and this is the thing I really want to drill into everyone's heads is for because everyone goes, oh my God, I'm like depressed, I'm anxious, or I'm hating someone, and I'm failing, I'm failing the course, and I'm miserable, I've gone back to square one. No, you haven't. That has to come up. Mm -hmm. That's the way home. So I'm going to celebrate that. Like... Oh, I totally celebrate that. Um, and it's really just getting into your head that no matter what is happening in the movie, whatever is coming up inside of you, that was already inside of you. And it has to come up. Mm. And that's the that's the Holy Spirit's purpose for the movie. That's the Holy Spirit's purpose for the movie is that you will get exactly what you need in order to puke <laughs> all the poison out of your soul. Purging almost, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's what it's for. It's that's what it's for, you know. And that and that's what's meant in the course by you know what could you not accept if you but knew that one, you know, um, planned you know, everything that's ever happened, past, present and future uh, mm -hmm. and only for your good. And that goes for the murder of your whole family. That goes for because it's, you know, none of that's real. That's a movie that's bringing us home to God, to a oneness joined as one. Yeah, I mean, I experienced that yesterday for a few hours where it was totally at peace and really yeah. right back in that change of place is beautiful. Absolutely. And never cling to it. Never yeah, cling no, to it. It's, it's like, <laughs> yeah, because people have experiences like those awakening experiences, and uh, and I know from how they tell me about it that it happened like five years ago, and they haven't really had it since, and they're just <laughs> they're clinging to it, going, "My God!" And that's wrong. No, who's who's the noticer of how you're feeling now? Who was the noticer of that experience? And it's just going back to do the work. It's always about what we're doing now. It's always about being in the cinema with Jesus now. It's always about just stepping back from being the piece of broken glass. Thank you, Keith. Thank you. Uh, ultimately, what we want, because we've said eventually the end of the journey, Jesus is saying the movie just plays and you have no thoughts about it. <laughs> You've no opinion on it. You've no interpretation of it. Um, that's what he means by who is the you that's living in the world? There's, there's no you living in the world. Um, it's an illusion that you believe. Um, and so um, what was the point I wanted to make about that? What was the last thing you said there? Because it just went straight out of my head. Just about <laughs> how, how not to cling on to. to yes, thank you very that. much. That's perfect. Yeah. Um, the pro okay, so that's that's what the end of the journey looks like, right? Now, the problem is that what we're doing as we watch the movie is we're not, because um, forgiveness is looking at the illusion without 
without judging it all right uh, which is what we mean by just the movie plays and you've no thoughts it's just no judgment uh, the problem is what we do in life is we we either cling or we try to push away and reject the movie that's playing Okay. that's what we do that's where it all goes wrong what we don't do is forgive the movie which is allowing it to be exactly what it is without needing it to be different and processing whatever comes up inside of us and clearing it out um instead what we do is we watch the movie and we cling these are my children <laughs> i remember when they were like five years old and you know it was so lovely and okay they don't visit me anymore <laughs> the fuckers <laughs> but i remember that those were the days those were the lovely days of my life now you see we're not letting the movie play and having it clear out our stuff so that we can just you know behold the illusion without judgment instead yeah. we're clinging to it and then but the the other thing that we do then is that we resist uh, we try to push it away and we try to like not deal with it. And um, and that's what causes all the problems. And, and that process of um, clinging or not wanting to deal with something, um, that has is what has created um, the insane voice talking to itself in your mind. Yeah. Um, that has grown completely out of, because you see, we come in here with the idea that um, there's something wrong with us, which is guilt. And then we set about the things that make me feel less guilty and let me cling to them and hold on to them. And these are the things that I like and these are the things I'm going to create more of in my life. And then there's the things that um, that make me feel 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 that guilt. OK, and then I like push that away. I don't want that. I'm not going to deal with that. And suddenly every decision that's being made in life in terms of what my career is, who my friends are, where I live, blah, 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 blah. All of that is based out of how do I avoid my guilt? how do I try and find covers for my guilt in the world things that will make me forget about my guilt and feel good for a few minutes and how do I um, push away the things that make me feel that guilt inside of me and that actually manufactures the voice in your head which Jesus says is not you you know it's not your real thoughts in, in the workbook lesson he says not your good thoughts and not your bad thoughts none of them none of your thoughts that are your personal thoughts are true all of them are a lie and they are simply um, they grow and all your preferences in life, all the things that you feel are so dear to you and close to your heart and the things that are important, all of that is based out of your guilt. All of that is a reaction to your guilt and none of it's you. That's the piece of broken glass. Mm -hmm. The only thing that's you is what looks and waits and judges not that changelessness inside of you. And that's what's healing is to dip into that um, and release everything else that's coming up in you with by looking at it with Jesus. So thanks, Adrian. Um, Thank, you. Thank you. So what should we, we do have next Sherry month? with her hand up. Cool, and Sherry. Then, then we, you can call it a day. Very good. Uh, Hi, everybody. Hi, Sherry. Hi, I have a quick question. Um, back to when you were discussing about the real world. Um, mm -hmm. And I wanted to say again to everyone I'm new, so if this is a strange question, Whenever, <laughs> Don't um, worry. of course, it, it, um, it says the real world, is it like the same as heaven? And is it like no. a capital real world? No. Okay. No. Um, so the real world is still something you're perceiving. Um, so, so in heaven, there's no perception because all is one. Um, to have perception, there must be a subject and an object. So there must be um, a me that's perceiving God. There must be an, uh, there must be a me that's aware of something that's not me. That doesn't exist in heaven. Um, Jesus says in the course that um, there's no part of mind sufficiently distinct to be aware of something that's not itself. Okay, so in heaven, there's no perceiving. Um, the, the knowledge is the word Jesus used for heaven. And uh, in knowledge, there is no knower and that which is known. There is just the knowing. Uh, there is just the oneness joined as one. So there's no God that knows himself in relation to Christ. And there's no Christ that knows himself in relation to God. There is just the oneness of heaven um, extending itself. 
um, for eternity. And so as soon as there's perception involved in the process, it's part of the illusion, it's part of consciousness. Um, but again, it's not our job to undo consciousness. That happens at, automatically at the very end of the journey, um, sometime after the real world. So, so the, the sense of an individual me will, will still be there in the real world. It's just that the me I experience myself as is the me that's everywhere. <laughs> um, so it will be knowing myself as Christ and seeing that as the truth behind all the figures coming and going and shifting and changing and murdering and dying and all it's it, it, it so that so but there would still be a me um even in the real world and so it's not heaven um because in heaven there would be no form okay yeah Thank you. Uh, jesus says god knows not form so heaven is formlessness and um and so the real world is really um it is the reflection it, 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 it's not heaven it is a reflection of heaven um so and and the reason it's a reflection of heaven is because you're experiencing oneness within the illusion the unity that's not a part of dreams is what you're experiencing in the dream so you have all the broken pieces of glass but you're aware of that which binds them all together um and so and, and again the the movie means nothing and in the real world you have undone all your guilt and your investment in the ego mind so there's no more projection of fault or blame or evil or sickness or death or anything onto the world instead your right mind is extending to the movie and therefore all you perceive in the movie is the love that's in your mind so it's kind it's of like still playing. the right world. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. And that's, and Jesus calls it the real world because none of us see the real world. What we see is our interpretation of the world because we're, we're giving it all the meaning it has for us. Um, and then he also says, if you could just accept that the world is meaningless and let the meaning be written on it for you, you would be extremely happy in one of the loveliest passages in the course. And the meaning it has is, behold the illusion, it's not real. Christ has never been a body, never suffered, um, can't die, um, can't be unhappy. Thank you for clarifying. Yeah. It would be a bit like, you know, again, the, the worms on the foot <laughs> on the sidewalk and the fact that they're getting killed, but Christ can't be killed. Um, nothing's nothing's in a body. Um, you know, um, it's 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 vision allowing you to see that light be. It's like it's like watching the movie, and then, you know, we begin by taking the movie very seriously, like it's a horror movie, and we're like scared, and we're shouting, and we're screaming, and then at some point during the movie, the screen on which it's projected starts to glow with a light, and. And you realize that light of the screen is the light that's in you. And, and that's what's true. And now you watch the horror movie and it doesn't matter because there's just light. So that will be the real world. Um, you're just watching the dream figures come and go, suffering and changing. You know, you're beholding the bodies, but you're beholding the light beyond the body, the idea beyond what can be touched. It's like, you know, it's like the movie is the ego going. You, you, it's, it's like you saying to the ego, hit me with your best shot. I don't believe any of it. I see the light shining behind all the images of death and decay and pain and starvation and all the rest of it. I don't buy it. I see the light of Christ shining behind all of it. That's that's the real world. Yeah. Thank you. All right. So um, thank you very much, everyone, for your attention. Of course, we've ran late as usual. Uh, I hope this was some way helpful by way of a little bit of a masterclass and a drilling down into the, the process of being in the cinema with Jesus. And so I'm sure we'll have loads of discussions with it in the in the group during the week. Thank you, everyone. Have a brilliant Sunday, whatever else you're doing. Um, but notice the noticer and you're with Jesus.
Thank you, Keith. So long all. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye